Tonight, uh, he will share his thoughts and research on a 21st century interpretation of fundamental Shin Buddhist teachings. So without further ado, Dr. Akuhishi, you have the floor. Okay, good evening. <clears throat> I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Toyama and Reverend Nishimura uh, Nishimoto, uh, Nishiyama for uh, this invitation to speak here tonight on Zoom to uh, the people who hopefully are interested in this topic. Uh, I kind of labeled it uh, myth, truth, and uh, science. And uh, the reason is um, one of the main concerns of our temples is the uh, fact that some of the younger members are not attending and we don't seem to be attracting new members. And I've been looking at this for some time, and so uh, I thought I would uh, share some thoughts of mine and ways that we might present Shin in a way that might attract new people. Um, the, uh, this is actually a follow-up from the uh, uh, Bloom Futaba lecture that I gave last Friday evening. And uh, I know there were other events going on, so I think that would be shared and they said that it would be on the uh, Honolulu Betsuin website in about a week. And so uh, what that talk was about was a uh, simplified way of introducing Shin Buddhism to a public that may not have any background. And this is something that I've been doing for some time. And it is to use familiar words as an introduction to our more traditional uh, concepts and uh, words. Also, I uh, suggest a, a path and actual uh, practice. Uh, so let me just take a couple of minutes and review that because it might be helpful uh, to give some background to the talk I'm, I'm doing tonight. Uh, basically, what I realize is that Shin is about receiving. And to acknowledge that we, we've received uh, many things from many people, we say thank you. Uh, this is difficult in a society where we're thinking of ourselves first and we're thinking a lot about achieving. So I talk about uh, uh, Shen being a religion of receiving and not achieving, where, and I think we know that hearing is an act of uh, receiving. Uh, Dr. Alfred Bloom uh, wrote in one of his books that um, voicing the Amida's name uh, uh, elicits a conversion or the turning of the mind. And that's what we're about, changing our mind from please to thank you. And he also wrote that gratitude as a way of, li uh, a way of life in Shinchu extends beyond physical or mental practice of recitation. And this whole attitude or arigatai, I think, has been influenced by Buddhism to the Japanese culture, where uh, you see that attitude uh, prevail throughout. And so uh, simply put, it's a shift from please, a desire for what I want to thank you, to appreciate what I have already received. So that's just kind of the um, background for um, the uh, talk we gave. Now, uh, uh, tonight what we're doing is, uh, you know, moving out from that. And we might even say that it's, uh, what do you do after you say please? Uh, we mentioned that a little bit in that talk, but uh, we find that many people are abandoning religion because uh, we think that the knowledge we have in this modern era explains a lot of the things that we had attributed to gods or uh, things of the unknown. And when we look around our uh, present society, we really see that what we have is far greater than, greater than what Siddhartha Gautama had as a prince. Uh, you know, we, he lived in the castle and had all the, the great things for a prince. And here, almost the average person or someone in a little, uh, let's say, the middle income class has all these things. Uh, we have comfortable homes, clean water, uh, good food, air conditioning, TV, cell phones, uh, health and safety conditions, uh, entertainment. We have the highest living standard of, I think, any human population uh, in history. And yet, uh, we have complaints. People are unsatisfied. And uh, I think we're to the point where uh, 
Prince Siddhartha realized the same thing. When he had this perfect life, he realized that old age, sickness, and death can affect anyone. And so he set out to find solutions for that. And we know that he discovered what we call the Dharma, the teachings of truth. And the great thing about this is that it works. And at his deathbed, he said, uh, don't just take any teachings, even mine, just on its word. It's not a belief. Test it out for yourself. And so for each of us, it's up to us to test out these words and these things that uh, he said. Well, the Dharma is true, and they work. And now science is, uh, I think, validating many of the things that he talked about. So that's the approach I want to take tonight, to look at the uh, Shin Buddhism from our new contemporary, almost scientific uh, background, to see what the uh, traditional mythology and the stories we hear really mean from uh, our perspective today. And basically, uh, my intention is that uh, I'm trying to encourage us to realize that spirituality is really what life is about. And the word spirituality may uh, be difficult. Again, it's a word. I'll try to define it uh, as we go along, but especially in the form of Shin Buddhism, which is oriented toward the common, ordinary working person. Now, this teaching that the Buddha had has influenced cultures and peoples for 2,600 years. Uh, it's difficult to understand at times because it's about life and death and the human condition. So these are not easy topics to explain. Uh, initially, when the Buddha was enlightened, he sat and contemplated whether people could understand what he uh, discovered. But he was encouraged to go out and spread his teachings, and so he did. And so initially, the people who followed him had to do what? They left their homes, and they became monks and nuns. So they had uh, none of the physical possessions to worry about. You know, they had one robe, a begging bowl, sleeping mat. And of course, every day they begged for their food. And so they didn't have a lot of the pressures that we do in trying to survive. Now, they were able to study and meditate and read uh, sutras and um, contemplate things all day long. But for those of us who lead ordinary lives, things are not uh, so easy in that manner. We have uh, families to take care of, business, uh, whatever jobs we have. And so there's a lot of stress. And yet the Buddha did leave a path for ordinary people who could not uh, leave their homes. And the Mahayana Buddhists, uh, you know, told us about the larger sutra. And then about 800 years ago, Shinnan really gave us an interpretation which uh, has helped us, which has uh, become uh, Jodhin Chin in America. Of course, we call it Chin Buddhism. Now, uh, in America, it gets confusing because we tend to judge religion from the, uh, you know, framework of Christianity. And so this adds to the confusion. Now, to give you uh, an idea of what this might uh, this might let's imagine that we have a coffee mug and uh, we didn't quite uh, clean out the, the mug after drinking coffee. So there's some stains there. Pour in some uh, Japanese Jodo Shinshu tea. Do you think that would taste good? <laughs> it wouldn't taste quite right. And that's kind of what's happening because we have this background, this lingering thought of what we think religion should be, what we think Buddhism should be. And so we have this kind of mixture of uh, leaving remnants of our old thinking. And so to try to avoid that, I want to look at uh, Shin Buddhism from a contemporary, uh, uh, you know, almost scientific point of view to see if we can come up with a, a, a version that, that we find attractive. Now, uh, our own relationship with Jolo Shinchu, as uh, some people could kind of distort things, uh, because uh, a lot of us went to Dharma school as kids and uh, junior YBA, and you know, religion was kind of um, uh, shown to us as young people. Uh, there's a story about uh, people who uh, live with elephants as uh, working animals. And it's said that when there's a baby elephant, what they do is uh, they have a rope tied around the elephant. And then they tie the rope around a huge tree. And when the baby elephant tries to get free or you know move about, it can't because this tree really anchors it. 
And so it learns that it's, uh, it cannot uh, escape once this uh, rope is put around something. But then later as an adult, the trainer can just put the rope around any little thing. And the grown elephant still remembers its childhood and thinks that the rope is tied to a tree. And so it doesn't uh, try to escape. And we're kind of like that. We have memories from our childhood about some things and perhaps religion. And so we still think that that's what uh, religion's about. And it might be negative. You know, we have to go to church on Sunday, uh, chant these foreign words and do things that we didn't think uh, we were real happy with. And so we have these negative ideas and they're immature thoughts, but they've stayed with us. And so our minds are still stuck in high school or so. And so uh, that may be one reason why many people have, you know, our younger people have left. And of course, they're busy with their conventional lives. But I'd like to make a point uh, with this talk of um, how uh, we're uh, neglecting that spiritual sign. Now, we know that in ancient times, deep truths were told in mythical stories. That was a way that people really could understand uh, something. They could experience that. Now, uh, we think we're a little more sophisticated. And so we tend to disregard these stories because in our modern science, we know, you know what causes uh, weather uh, problems, hurricanes. Uh, we know about earthquakes, uh, eclipses. And so uh, we tend to disregard some of these stories and think that they just kind of speak to an older time when people weren't as bright as we think we know. And I think that's the same way as teenagers, that uh, they may hear some things from some noted people. But if you recall our age as teenagers, uh, we knew better than uh, the adults. And so um, I think religion has been put as secondary because I know with my own kids, uh, you know, uh, making a living is quite important. It's, it's hard. Uh, you know, you have kids, they're active, they're in all these different things, uh, just to uh, own a house and earn a living, so forth, uh, buy gas and so on and so forth. And so uh, the material world seems to be the most important and religion, spirituality is secondary. Now, what I hope to do is uh, demonstrate that the Buddhist teaching uh, is really about the basic workings of the universe. And as, as such, if we align our lives with those basic truths, then our, our lives would be brighter. Buddhism is about waking up, and it's waking up, and it's really seeing that uh, what life is about is uh, uh, realizing that we have received so much more than we can achieve in anything that we've done. Uh, we might feel proud that, you know, we've studied or we've worked and we uh, worked our way to a certain position. But if we were to look at it from another position, we're, we would realize that we were supported all the time by parents, teachers, other people, just things that uh, have been created so that our lives are safe. You know, as I said, with our uh, standard of living, all of these things were created by the efforts of others, basically for our benefit. And yet we take credit for, you know, doing well in this situation. Now, here, uh, you know, the world is complex. And I think one way to look at this is to put this whole thing, uh, our lives in kind of two categories. The first level we might call, you know, the conventional or ordinary level. And this is how we live our lives. We think that uh, the material life is uh, paramount. So that's one level. And often in religious talking, we, we talk about that being a horizontal uh, plane. And then there's that spiritual plane, and we talk about a vertical line. And that's a little more difficult. And, and this is why I think uh, it's important to uh, kind of delineate the two, because often we get them confused. Much of what the masters were talking about were about the spiritual uh, concerns. Life and death was critical at, in those days, and so the things they were talking about really had to do with life and how we viewed death. And uh, when we hear it today, it sounds kind of uh, mystical, uh, it's mythological, we don't think it, it matters. But there are deep, deep uh, meaning to that, even to us modern humans. And so uh, 
since I said we'll start with the scientific level, I'm going to uh, start with this. Uh, and okay, now everyone's getting scared, and a uh, few people are going to sleep now. <laughs> e equals m c squared. It says energy equals mass times the speed of light, uh, uh, twice the speed of light, or, or squared, the speed of light squared. So basically what this says is mass and energy are two forms of the same thing. This is the same thing. Now, the atom bomb uh, really is a horrible example of you know, how mass, uh, when it releases its energy, you know, the destruction it can form. So if we look at something else, like uh, a piece of wood, a branch uh, burning, we can see that the wood emits light and heat. And so we do see that mass uh, can, uh, as it changes form, releases energy. Now, the way that got there was that the seeds of this tree planted in the ground, you know, received energy from the soil, from water as it grew, it got it from the sun, other nutrients from the air, uh, probably carbon dioxide as it changed it, uh, it to oxygen for us. And so the tree grew because of things it received, it received energy. And so uh, as it grew, it grew more mass in terms of the, the trunk, the branches, leaves, the uh, blossoms and fruit. And so uh, we're like that tree in that we're gaining all these things from others, we're gaining energy. And so you see the, you know, the wood is just releasing that again. Now, uh, this is what, uh, hopefully we can agree that uh, these two things are equal. Is that, uh, well, you could put th something in the chat, but uh, I think that's a basic uh, truth in uh, science that mass and energy are uh, somewhat interchangeable or they're two forms of the same. And so what I want to propose here is that we're on this earth. So we also are, have two forms and one is body and one is spiritual. And we might eat the body with mass. And we have massive bodies. That's kind of an insult, but uh, we might equate spirituality with energy. And so we're partial. We have two forms of the same thing. I'll get to impermanence and interdependence in a little bit. But uh, uh, hopefully we can agree with that, that since everything on Earth uh, is said to be uh, mass and energy, since we're part of the Earth, we're also body and spirituality. Now, uh, this word spirituality, you know, is kind of tricky. People have different ideas when we say spirit, but... Uh, you can put your own uh, thoughts or words into that uh, area. Now, um, let's see. Uh, in a sense, we're like that tree. We start out uh, just a couple of cells, and we grow into this, uh, uh, not even an infant, but, uh, you know, our mothers uh, give us nourishment until we're born. And then uh, we're given, you know, milk and nutrients. Uh, people take care of us. We have water, we have the sun, air. And, and we grow, we receive, we're receiving all the time. And we also uh, receive the energy and the wisdom from our parents. Uh, that first, uh, let's say 20 years or so, the first part of our lives, all we're doing is receiving education, uh, proper care, uh, education, all of that. And so, let's see. Um, uh, we're just receiving all these things. Let's see. Uh, and let me just go back here. Okay. Um, again, I'm having trouble, as I said, because uh, my slides don't have numbers on it, and I have uh, numbers on my notes, so I'm not sure I'm on the right slide. But, uh, you know, we're receiving all these things. And uh, when we receive things, uh, it's, uh, you know, proper for... Uh, aware of things, we say thank you. And we say namo amidabasu, and before meals, we might be saying itadakimasu. Again, honoring and respecting and expressing gratitude for what we receive. Now, 
Uh, the Buddha told us about the cause of our discontent. I said, we're the richest uh, nation in the world. Things are great, and yet we have complaints. And so what the Buddha told us in the Four Noble Truths is that on the upper left side, we have dukkha or discontent. And uh, sometimes people use the word suffering. And the cause of that is hatred, greed, ignorance, this attachment to the ego. And we see the third noble truth on the upper right side as nirvana or just bliss. And below that, the Eightfold Path, which can help us go from, you know, this uh, 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 area of discontent to, to bliss. I put it in this quadrant form because I think what's important here for us is this middle line. That if we are monks, we might be trying to really control this area and move into here. But again, as I said, as uh, in monastic life, uh, all you do all day long is just, um, you know, listen to uh, read and study and so forth. But as ordinary people, we have to do a lot of things, effort, and we're not so able to be here. So I think uh, we need to look at things differently and realize that since things are impermanent and they change all the time, what we're doing is um, trying to balance things. And we're balancing the, uh, you know, the negative things, what we would call negative with the positive. So here, and in the uh, uh, other lecture, the Bloom Futaba lecture, I talk about Shinnan's use of the metaphor that uh, clouds of greed, hatred, and ignorance cover the sky of the sun. But he realizes that under the sun, there is brightness, not dark. And that's a very optimistic view. What he's saying that we don't really get rid of this uh, lower left quadrant, but then even with all that discontent, we balance it and we balance it with gratitude. And I have a suggestion in that talk uh, on you know how we might get there using the Eightfold Path, not as a means of achieving, but this path or process as a means of realizing what we have already received. So again, this middle line kind of represents uh, what the Buddha talked about as the middle path, that we're always balancing things. Uh, that's a, a standard of nature, you know, oil and water, whatever it is uh, we have in the weather systems, high pressure and low pressure systems, but uh, nature is always balancing itself. And so yeah, it's this, uh, when we feel off balance, that we realize that the, the way to handle that is to do the other thing that will help balance it. Now, uh, let's see. Okay, now, okay, jump the gun. Okay. Um, now, uh, you get to see me again. Okay. Uh, you know, myths and the spiritual realm don't always work the way we think they do. We have an idea, but uh, myths are a little different. They're deep, and um, they work a little differently. And I think there's a very popular myth in America uh, where we believe that there's this uh, fat, jolly uh, guy with a white beard. He wears a red suit. And uh, he rides a reindeer that pulls a sled. And every Christmas, he pulled by eight reindeer, and they fly through the sky. And what happens is uh, he gives presents to all the boys and girls, uh, not only in America, but in many parts of the world. And, uh, you know, we, we hear this myth, and, uh, of course, some of us sophisticated adults I might wonder, well, I don't know about that. You know, is it physically possible for this one guy with reindeer who fly and uh, just going to millions and millions of homes, dropping off these presents? And, you know, that's a myth. And we're not too sure that, uh, you know, that happens that way. But in your experience, does that happen? It actually does. Not in the way that the myth may say, you know, literally. But every morning on uh, uh, Christmas morning, celebrating the birth of Jesus, uh, children wake up and they have presents, uh, thinking that it came from this jolly man. So this myth actually uh, works, not in the way we uh, think it should, but it works. 
And sometimes uh, what we look at, like this, uh, you know, listening to this story, uh, we see things that are obvious and we think that's true. So we hang on to that. And things that are not so obvious, we're not too sure. So we, you know, it's like uh, religion. We put that into another category. We're not too sure about that. But then, uh, then uh, how many of us have seen a nice sunrise or sunset? Um, you know, we see the sunrise in the east and set in the west. And we think, ah, you know, beautiful sunset. And we see this quite often every day. Um, I don't know if you're an early riser or uh, uh, like me, like to watch sunsets more than sunrises. But anyway, so we see this every day and we run our lives accordingly. And again, California time is different than uh, Hawaii time. And so the world works on, on these principles, uh, sun rising in the east, setting in the west. And so this is something that's very observable. Now, all of you are watching this on Zoom right now. And uh, I think uh, most of us have cell phones. Uh, some of us watch uh, satellite TV. And there are all kinds of things. Now, how would that work in a world where the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, where the uh, sun revolves around the earth? If we really planned it that way, our rocket ships would go up and crash somewhere. That wouldn't happen. Because what happens is the, uh, and we know this, uh, the earth revolves around the sun. And this was a truth that took, uh, uh, let's see, uh, Copernicus and um, who had Galileo, you know, they got them into trouble. And I think for a couple of hundred years, the Catholic had, Catholics had ex excommunicated them. And so that's the truth that was not so visible. And so what you see, uh, as uh, true reality is this. We have an earth that's spinning around the sun. And the sun is just uh, one star in this galaxy. And here we are, we could call this the Milky Way. First time I saw the Milky Way, I thought it was a uh, you know, thin veil of clouds, but it was uh, the light from all these billions of stars. And it's hard to believe that uh, there are billions of stars in this galaxy. But then we're told that there are billions of galaxies in the universe and that the universe is expanding. Can we uh, agree with that? I think that's true. Uh, they just sent up the James Wood uh, telescope and we, we have photos of that. So that's a truth that is a little more difficult to see, but our science tells us that it's true. And the truth that we live with every day, you know, sunrise, sunset, is not so true. So what I'm saying here is that there are some truths that we have that uh, we don't believe and yet are necessary for our more modern, sophisticated life. Again, we wouldn't be able to be on Zoom or watch TV or have many of these things if we stayed with that old truth of the earth, uh, of the sun spinning around the earth. Now, uh, I want to present another perspective. Uh, and that uh, this, again, I want to bring to a kind of a, a scientific uh, point of view. This is what the Buddha said. Uh, he gave us uh, what's called the three marks of existence. He's saying that everything uh, follows these three marks. And that uh, on Earth, everything we know is impermanent. Everything changes. And that means there's death. Uh, physical mass changes, and at some point, uh, living things die. And we see this, uh, you know, constantly, everything changes. So we witness and really understand and believe this. The other thing is uh, interdependence. Everything is interconnected. Now, this is where I place kind of spirit or spirituality, because spirit in, uh, pervades everything. It's like energy. It's everlasting. It's infinite. It goes, uh, you know, comes from uh, before and goes on after. It's uh, uh goes on and on. So as humans, all we have to do is uh, align ourselves with these two truths. But being human, uh, we, you know, have the third mark of ex existence. And sometimes it's said to be third and fourth marks, but uh, the third being 
you know, dukkha or suffering and the fourth being the uh, release of that or nirvana. I, I just like to put the Four Noble Truths out, saying again that the third mark of existence is this balance between discontent and bliss, and that it's kind of our choice. And it's not that we choose this or that, but it's this balance because constantly we're balancing all these things. Now, um, let's see. So this is what we're balancing, uh, impermanence. Uh, whatever has a material or mass, you know, has birth, grows, and dies. And that concerns us because we know that we have this body, you know, part of us, one form is this mass. And uh, we had birth, we're growing, and now death awaits us. But also the other part is true. There's interdependence, which is infinite. It's about relationships. And interdependence uh, is like love. You know, we have separate bodies. We're in these different screens and different locations. So we're separate. So that's something, you know, that we see and we think is more true, like the sunrise and sunset. And then this uh, thing of interdependence of relationships and ideas floating around, uh, wisdom, compassion, that can pervade uh, and go and flow among everything. And so these, again, these two things are true. Um, this is where I, I think when we look at uh, these two truths, we realize that uh, the fear of death coming from impermanence can be balanced by this uh, uh, attitude that we are spiritual. We have interdependence. We have this uh, notion of uh, a spirit, uh, you know, pervading all of us. Uh, something that connects us, and we know that's true. Um, and so, again, where are we putting our attention? Most of the time, it's about enhancing our body, trying to be healthy, you know, look good, uh, buy a better car, and so forth. Uh, but I think we can see the value in this by the story, and Shinran tells it in Shoshinge in a shortened form, but he talks about Tan Luan, and Tan Luan is... Uh, he designates as the first Chinese uh, patriarch. And Tang Luan has an illness, and he uh, goes to a, another master, a Taoist master, where he learns Taoist techniques, and it brings him back to health. And he leaves becoming a, a Taoist master. And on the way home, he runs into Bodhiruchi, who is an Indian in China, uh, spreading Buddhism. And... Uh, as they meet, uh, Tan Wan kind of brags, yeah, I was very sick, uh, near death, and yet uh, because of the Taoist uh, teachings, I really uh, have come back to health, and now I'm a master, and, you know, uh, things are very good. And I was fortunate enough to take a class from Roger Corliss, who wrote the book basically on Tan Wan, and as he puts it, uh, Bodhiduchi spits on the ground <laughs> and says, uh, well, uh, you know, you're back to health now, but you're still going to die. And uh, the legend has it that they burn the, the scrolls and the sutras, and the uh, Taoist scrolls burn and the sutras don't. So Tan Luan becomes uh, a Buddhist, and uh, Xinlan, after a while, that designates him as an important uh, lineage uh, connection to uh, Zhou Du Xinxu uh, as the first Chinese patriarch. But that story just puts into focus all the attention we put into uh, maintaining ourselves, you know, the plastic surgery, the exercise, you know, which is all good, eating the right foods and so forth. But that's paying attention to this left side, impermanence. Uh, we're still going to die. Shunryu Suzuki has this little saying in that he says, life is like boarding a ship that goes off to sea that will sink. And so when we really get the uh the truth of that it kind of shakes us up and so it is this uh side on the, the right the spirituality that we might pay attention to so again this is uh where we are we're here not in the rooms where you know we can see each other and we see the backgrounds and so forth we're in these little rooms and houses but we're actually on this planet earth 
spinning around, uh, you know, a sun that's spinning around this galaxy. This galaxy is spinning around other galaxies. And so this is true reality. Now, um, you know, just wondering how science has told us about this. And philosophy, you know, there's a lot uh, that philosophers has told us. But do they have an answer to this? You know, what is our answer that we're on this tiny planet in this universe? And what do the philosophers say? Well, I think that shows us the limits of some of the things that we have depended on. Um, so uh, the question is, how can we become more spiritual? And becoming more spiritual may not be what we think it is. You know, when I say that, uh, we might think, oh, we, we have to do good things or, you know, think of all these. Uh, spiritual has that connotation where it's woo-woo. But uh, I, I think if we look at spirit as energy, we can realize that it's about engaging in activities that serve others. Because we have received this energy from others. And so it is, in a sense, to pay back. And here we have a song that often uh, sung on Sundays, Ondok San. And in it, it says, the depth of gratitude I owe my Dharma teachers, I will express until my bodily form is finally shattered. And so there are things we do to become spiritual, not as a means to achieve anything, any merit or, you know, good, uh, 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 you know, accolades from others. But we do good things and serve others because we uh, are aware that we have received these things throughout our whole life. And because of that, we're where we are. And because of that, we're able to serve others. And uh, again, looking at this fact of uh, body and spirit, one way to reduce our, our body fat <laughs> is, it's a great diet, is to serve others. And we'll find that it, it's a great diet and it feels good doing things for others. And I know most of you uh, do this. But uh, what I'm uh, trying to declare here is that that is the spiritual part of us. And that is the part that we might uh, share with others. That uh, gaining more mass, more bodily, you know, accidents of uh, cars or houses or whatever it might be, uh, really leads to more... Uh, you know, uh, dissatisfaction. And yet when we uh, give, when we serve others, it feels great. And we do it as an expression of gratitude. And uh, this is uh, what I mean by uh, turning from uh, the body uh, mass to the spiritual side. So again, in, uh, uh, now, uh, if we look at, uh, you know, going back to the the mythology and the sutras, as I said, I'm looking at Jodo Shinshu from a scientific point of view, uh, since science is not able to answer our questions. Uh, if you have an answer from science, yeah, put it in the chat. But uh, we have, uh, the, from the largest sutra, you know, the myth of uh, Dhammakara, the Bodhisattva Dhammakara, who goes to another Buddha, Lokeshvara Raja, makes these 40 vows and becomes Amida Buddha. And so uh, in this, he says that by uh, voicing his name, Namo Amida Butsu, we are assured birth in this pure land. I like to say pure realm, because I think it's more of a, uh, an attitude, a, a, a situation rather than a, a ge geographical place. And so again, this is mythology, but uh, as Shinan says often, that there's an implicit meaning to this. There's a deeper meaning than just, uh, uh, you know, what seems to be said. And uh, to break down these words uh, in mythology, let's see what uh, Namo Amidaba Tsumai mean. Amida is the Japanese word that combines two Sanskrit words, Amitabha, which means immeasurable light, uh, uh, and Amida could also uh, is uh, combined with Amitayus, limited life. Uh, we use the human uh, experiences of wisdom and compassion. But again, Amida means that, um, you know, I am one, uh, that uh, immeasurable uh, light and limitless life. 
And uh, often the term Amida, uh, you hear me use the words uh, effort of others, which seems to downgrade Amida from uh, you know a sacred position. But what I mean by that is, uh, um, Efforts of others, not just the efforts of other humans, but animals and plants and minerals, because all these things, uh, you know, uh, not that animals uh, voluntarily give up their lives, but uh, things have worked, uh, you know, for our benefit. There have been sacrificed uh, labor, uh, lives given, and the efforts of others, I even think of uh, uh, geology, where uh, continents are moving, astronomy, where, you know, meteors have hit the earth, got rid of those pesky uh, dinosaurs so that uh, us, the little uh, mammals could run around and eventually become human. It involves evolution. You know, how did these little mammals uh, survive and become primates and eventually humans? And that uh, those huge dinosaurs uh, evolved into uh, those nice birds we see. But also efforts of others is the innovation in science that helps us in our medical field and you know sanitation, car safety, things like that. So efforts of others is one way of uh, having Amida closer to us, that it, it just doesn't have to represent this godlike being, but it's just all the things that have happened that have supported our lives. Yeah. Uh, when we say Namo Amida Butsu, we can say I am one with or I take refuge in Amida Buddha. And so it's our connection, uh, we take refuge or we're accepted. And Amida Buddha then can mean everything of light, the efforts of others. Amida Buddha could just be the experience of life, or wisdom and compassion. So what we're saying is that we're one with all of this. And it's not because of my efforts, but because I've received this. And uh, uh, the next uh, thing I want to do is a little, uh, let's see. Yeah, this part um, is kind of a, a heavier step. So those of you who may not want to venture into this, you could uh, you know, uh, just kind of uh, take a little nap. But, what we're talking about is us humans here. We talk about the three bodies of Buddha and that we humans, uh, Nirmanakaya, uh, the Buddha was an actual human. Amida represents something and we talk about this Buddha nature, Dhammakaya, and this is inconceivable. And I like to say Buddha nature, or Dhammakaya, is that universe we saw, that picture. And that was only a small picture of one galaxy, this Milky Way. But then... Uh, it's uh, all of this universe. And what I think Dharmakaya is, is that thing that they say the universe is expanding into. What is this universe and what is it that it's expanding into? And how far does that go? <laughs> Again, these things are incomprehensible. And because, uh, and, and yet scientists tell us that's true. And because that's true, we're not in our little room. We are in our little rooms, but then the true reality is this whole thing, you know, the uh, uh, the universe. And what uh, the Buddhists have, uh, what the Buddha is able to do is give us this representative, Amida Buddha, light and life. And Buddha is just representing that which we uh, are not able to really conceive. Uh, these are supposed to be little arrows, and you see that the uh, Amida Buddha brings, you know, uh, we're receiving this, and then the little arrows are our return voicing of Namo Amidabutsu, but it all comes this way. Now, the reason this is important, um, okay, let's go back. Um, the reason this is important is one of the uh, greatest things we humans uh, need is to be accepted. And we have this image that we're accepted just as we are. And that image of the, of the planets and all is not just uh, one where uh, we're lost in space. It's that somehow we were born in this. 
And what are we born into? Uh, we're born in one of the greatest times and where we have all these conveniences. In fact, we have uh, the conveniences that uh, our children and grandchildren may not have because we're using up all the resources. And so this is the awakening we're waking up to. And this, again, leads to what we do with our bodies, what, how we give back. Because I think as Shen Buddhists and as a Buddhist, an, uh, a, a person who is awake, we don't, don't just sit back and, uh, you know, talk about hopes and prayers, but we're able to do things because we become one of the vow. And this is where the vow comes in. That, again, through this mythology, we don't have uh, science just saying, well, this is how it is. The Buddha explained it to us that there's something that goes on in the universe which has allowed humans uh, to become self-conscious, to be conscious of their own existence. Uh, about 100,000 years ago, uh, humanoid-type uh, uh, primates, uh, they say about uh, 50,000 years ago, uh, they're finding evidence of the first burials. But anyway, uh, that humans really began to leave the animal kingdom in the sense that uh, they were able to contemplate their own existence. And the Buddha is, because of this uh, uh, situation, the Buddha explained it in the terms, in these terms of a vow going through, uh, you know, infinite history and that we are part of that. And if we are part of that, then because we've received so much, we're part of the vow to serve others. And so this uh, whole thing about being separate, uh, I think we can move into this area of uh, uh, becoming spiritual by again, helping others. And especially in this uh, area of uh, uh, in our, uh, yeah, helping others. Um, now, Okay, so what I'm saying here again, uh, let's see if I, yeah. Okay, uh, now it's not that uh, we have to just become uh, spiritual. I think we're all, we do this naturally because uh, at many of our temples, we help other people. We have committees or we have uh, activities where we're collecting things for people. And what I wanna say here is that we're doing that, again, not as a means of achievement, but as uh, kind of de demonstrating that we are aware that we have received. And so in turn, we're helping others. And I just have this picture of the Alameda Buddhist Temple where they decorated these wheelchairs. Uh, you can see the, uh, where man, they put the carp and, you know, all these uh, things on the wheelchairs. And these are for some of the elders who have difficulty walking, but they uh, did this so that they can join in Obon dancing. And I know other temples do other things like this, but it's repaying our teachers. Uh, it's just that uh, this is what we do when we become awake and um, you know, we help others. So getting back to this ordinary life uh, and the spiritual, um, we, Go back to Einstein. The, the point I'm trying to make here are uh, several. Uh, looking at the uh, Shin Buddhism and our mythology, there are things that uh, we see. From Einstein's uh, E equals MC squared, uh, we see that there is impermanence, but then it's balanced by uh, interdependence, the spiritual side. And the obvious, like uh, the sunset, uh, sunrise, sunset, and the obvious, like the body, uh, are superseded by something deeper, that it is the earth that is circling the sun. And there is this uh, whole truth of the universe that the Buddha knew intuitively. He didn't have a, a James Wood telescope or any ways to uh, determine this, but intuitively uh, he knew this. And so he gave these mythical stories, you know, of the Dhammakata. And yet you see that this story uh, helps us in this modern age where science just stops and says, well, this is how it is. And what the story tells us that we are part of this and those in the past have been part of this and they have all been for our benefit to help us wake up. So being part of the vow 
we can help others, that we look uh, to the future. And uh, the talk I have been giving is to shift from please to thank you, and then to add Namo Amidabatsu. And in that uh, way, I think that thank you uh, keeps us in the practical realm, the horizontal realm, where we're really appreciating gifts of life. And Namo Amidabutsu, or Namandas, places us in that spiritual realm. Well, what we're actually saying is thank you for the gift of life, because this is how uh, deep it goes. And that we can live uh, on and on in infinite life if we turn our minds to the reality that part of us is spiritual. And if we're feeling uh, pressured, unbalanced, building up too much mass, we can. Uh, let go of that mass, how? By serving others. And we find that that is how, uh, you know, uh, we Shin Buddhists are active in the world. And so I think we can take part in activities. Uh, you know, if you see uh, things happening at the temple, you can become involved. And I think we do at some part, but, you know, we seem to have limits. And yet I'm saying uh, we can do more of that. Uh, I think we all know, and uh, I met some people this weekend that, uh, you know, help out at the temple all the time. And you rarely see them, but they're always helping out. And they do it without any fanfare, without any recognition. They're cleaning up or they're doing all these little things, volunteering, uh, not wanting any recognition. And this is just naturally knowing that they're part of this whole uh, system of receiving and they silently, quietly go about the, their way, uh, giving back to others. Uh, we call those people Nyoko names or people who just know instinctively that they are part of the whole and they quietly uh, give to others. So, you know, when you uh, see, you know, and, and you might be saying, oh, those idiots on the board make those stupid decisions. Uh, you might think, well, I'll join those idiots. I'm, uh, you know, <laughs> I'll give them some idiotic, uh, instead of just complaining, we could join. This is, uh, we have uh, volunteer organizations. Or, you know, at your work or uh, uh, in different organizations in the community, even in politics, uh, we have lots of things that could use help. And we can either build up our, uh, our mass, our uh, bodies, uh, enhance that with, you know, looking better, or we can just spend time uh, giving to others. And as we find that uh, we give to others, that really... Uh, uh, makes us not just feel good, but it uh, has us uh, have this experience of being one with uh, a larger group. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And so uh, I'll just leave this. Uh, Shin Buddhism is about appreciating what I have to balance the desires for what I lack. Uh, all this, I think, is um, to uh, lean toward that spiritual side. And that if, if um, our lives are about shifting to the spiritual, that end of life will come. And, and yet, uh, having uh, taken part in uh, this spiritual, the energy side, uh, I think we'll be ready. And there's uh, one thing we could think about that, uh, you know, if we know, uh, if we're older and we know that the end of life is coming, uh, we could think in a couple of different ways. We might ask, uh, you know, please, can I have uh, one more month? We might ask, please, can I have one more week of life? Or please, can I have one more day? Or can we say, thank you. Thank you for the last month. Thank you for the last week. And thank you for this last day. So please join me in uh, expressing our deepest appreciation for life itself and in the daily expression of gratitude by saying thank you, Namandavs, and Gasho Namo Amidabutsu. So again, please join me in Nembutsu Gasho. Gasho Namo Amidabutsu, Namo Amidabutsu, Namo Amidabutsu, Namo Amidabutsu. Namo Amidabutsu. Okay, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, uh, Reverend Akahoshi. I have a, a couple questions, okay? Um, <laughs> so you talk about uh, balance, 
from what I got is that on one side is ordinary life and the other side, the spiritual life. And, um, and then is, are you uh, saying that, that the, uh, what we should be doing is moving our life from the ordinary to the spiritual or are you, and that, that, that should be, uh, the goal. Or are you saying that the real goal of, of living is to achieve a balance between the ordinary life and the spiritual life? Hmm. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, I'll say this. The reason I, I say this is that I think all of us uh, are, as the scientists tell us, two forms of the same thing. And when we suffer, it is because there's we're probably putting an emphasis on uh, the uh, material and that to relieve that we can uh, think of life more in the spiritual and again I look at the Issei and Nisei especially those who went into camps you know first is uh, immigrants being uh, you know, discriminated against and then in camp losing everything they live, live practical lives far worse than we <laughs> and yet you know things came through and I was just able to be at um, Duncan Williams's um, uh, event where he was uh, really championing uh, those people who went into camps and came through. And it was the spiritual, I think, that uh, helped people through. They appreciated what they had. And so um, it's, uh, again, uh, we could have people, uh, and we do have a few people who are too spiritual. They help out too much and neglect family life. Uh -huh. and so there's just this balance. But I think most of us, you know, are... Uh, really in this category of uh enhancing the body or you know the in the self right. you know uh, the three poisons and all i'm saying is by focusing on the spiritual side while we're alive and i see you know nisi and ise especially that they uh, face death very calmly you know <laughs> and even younger people not the ones uh, in their 90s I i've seen you know friends in their 50s who pass very quietly I, I remember one guy, um, yeah, this was 30 years ago in his 50s, saying, no, I'm not going to have chemo. Uh, you know, I'll get a few more months. And he was ready. Uh, but anyway, that uh, to acknowledge that half another form of us is spiritual that we're neglecting. And so this uh, basically I'm trying to encourage people who are making, you know, sweating so much to get that second car or the better home that there, uh, in fact, a friend just passed away who lived a modest life, but his life is about service to others in many areas. And uh, led, a, I think, a happy life. Had two grown kids who are wonderful, mm -hmm. but we don't see him in fancy cars or, or whatever, but mm -hmm. we just acknowledge that he spent his life serving everyone. You know? So you, um, in the simplest terms, I, what I've got about the but moving towards a more spiritual life is uh, engaging in activities that serve others. That is in um, that is the path. Mm -hmm. um, and Namuami Dabutsu is also the path, or also part of the path, or the Nembutsu. Well, number two, is, as I'll explain, is in, inexplicable <laughs> as chapter 10. <laughs> and so I'm just throwing out different experiences of that. It, it's gratitude. I'm using gratitude. I'm using thank you as an entry because, you know, I explained it. And then, you know, that uh, three-tiered uh, description I gave with uh, Dharmakaya, that gets kind of heavy duty. So most people can bypass that. But what I'm saying is, we're in the universe that's inconceivable. Mm. So what's it all about? <laughs> you know, and I think rich because we're human, the Buddha gave us these uh, guides to say there's richness in being with other people. That's what we want to do, and we're all part of this. And that's what I think the message continues to be: that uh, yeah, that service. You know, our interconnection with others is as valid as building the self. Uh, and okay. so Namo Hamidabutsu has many meanings, you know. Uh, I think the talk I gave at um, uh, 
where was it? Moilini was about uh, saying Nembutsu, you know, changing their minds and it helps us in times of grief, happiness, being together. Uh, at any instance, we could uh, shout out Namo Amidabutsu, and it has a different meaning, uh, but it's about uh, acknowledging life in whatever form we experience it. So it's, uh, yeah, I, I don't, there are many definitions, and I think this is what each person has to experience for themselves. And gratitude is just one step that is familiar, because people can experience thank you and, and know that, oh, this is part of this Nam Mandav. It, it could also mean other things, and it does mean many, many other things. It, and it, the beauty is that it helps in everyday life, and it helps in that spiritual life, in the deepest appreciation of life itself. Mm. So that's the magic of Nembutsu, Namo Amidabutsu. Okay, just one more uh, uh, request for clarification. So I, I have, I have struggled with the whole concept of uh, who, what is Amida. Well, read lots of stuff, and um, and you presented the idea that one way of thinking of Amida was is that it's the effort of others that is that what you were suggesting that that's one way of thinking of amida yes because the written word again written 800 years ago when mythology said you know we don't know where these things come from and amida is often given in a theistic way and uh translated it comes out that way that really kind of um uh, puts uh, many modern people, uh, you know, it scares them away because it's so, it sounds so much like uh, come to our church, you know, God uh, or Jesus will help you, you know, your sinner will help you. Mm -hmm. We say, well, you're an ignorant fool, Amida will help you. So it's not very helpful. <laughs> but then if you use these lay terms, which people are familiar with, uh, at least hopefully they'll come back a second and third time and find out that the efforts of others, I can relate to that, teachers, parents. But these are also uh, examples and demonstration of Amida's compassion. We use these words, Amida's compassion. I'm not quite sure what that means, but efforts of others, I can kind of relate to that. Uh, so again, these are terms that sound very simplistic. You know, please, thank you, me, the we. <laughs> and yet uh, they're uh, relatable, I think. And I think uh, hopefully it will bring people in to see the benefits, the deeper benefits that Shin has to offer. But these are all words that reflect the truth. We are the result of the efforts of others. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have this uh, image of a, a you know, um, theistic, uh, you know, person. Even our, um, you know, in, the, in our altar, you can have a picture, a statue, or the Chinese characters. And uh, I think Renuel said that the Chinese characters are the best because you don't have this image. Well, sometimes I really like to see that statue at our home of Woodstown we have a statue and it's it's reassuring to see a human figure saying come as you are uh so uh, uh yeah we relate to the different images of Amida in different ways the word the sound of the word uh you know chanting Namandav seeing a human figure seeing Chinese characters whatever it is but uh all these things represent something that, uh, as she mentioned, is incomprehensible. <laughs> mm. But yeah, well, it is, I say it's life, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I definitely appreciate the, uh, that image that you know, you've added one more image in my mind about Amida, because the one that we, we hear in temples over and over again, the phrase immeasurable light, limited light, life, over and over. But there is the uh, it becomes meaningless after a while because there's no experience that mm. attached to it. And in your case, what you did just now, effort of others is an experience. I I know that experience, and now it's attached to immeasurable light and limited life. And so that that a re constantly repeated phrase that has lost meaning has new meaning because you've added to it so that's 
of great value to me, and I thank you very much for that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Well, that was a, a, a big part of my Futaba, uh, Bloom Futaba talk in that we give out words like Namandals, and if they have no experience behind it, then it's meaningless. But having some experience behind it, like thank you, I, I have an experience of thank you. Mm -hmm. So that draws me in. <laughs> Uh, but we do need, and I attach a practice to it, actually, a practice of realizing what we've received. We don't mm -hmm. just, and I say, you have to do the practice. If you listen to the talk and say, oh, that was a good talk, it's not a good talk unless you do the practice and you yeah. get an experience of what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, but And it, it's not a, a regimented practice, but yeah, it's something to do. And you can expand on that, uh, use uh, different ideas with that. But anyway, it is important to attach familiar words where people have the personal experience of a word, and then that can expand into the more traditional language and uh, the depth that you know we kind of went into today. Yes. Well, thank you very much. Um, let me put it out there. Um, do do any of you have um, questions? I kind of dominated the question part, but. Um, Piper, uh, so far in the chat box, um, it just like the four upper three, and they're thanking to uh, Kao Sensei's lecture, but no pressure yet. Okay. Yeah. Oh, uh, Pete, you have a question? Hi, Aloha. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear Great. you. Um, yes, like you, Piper, I have two questions. I'll, I'll, ma I'll make a uh, I'll summarize if I may, but first I got to start by just thanking uh, Akoshi Sensei. Um, you know, as a recovering high school teacher, I always appreciate that <laughs> good teachers weren't really that who knew a lot, but knew how to, you know, make others understand what it, what they need to know. And you did that very well, Mahalo. Uh, my first question is you framed your talk a lot with the analogies of science. And would you say, that was just one tool of many to, uh, you know, make these truths, inconceivable truths, uh, more understandable. So, in other words, you use science. Could you just as easily um, use social science, you know, to make it relevant? Mm -hmm. So then you could be, you know, mm -hmm. anthropology, economics, political science, mm -hmm. or the, just the same way uh, myths, you know, are expressed through literature and yeah. culturally through music. It all kind of, it's another way of understanding these uh, in inconceivable truths. Um, right. So no, I, yeah, I think uh, it's because of my own background. You know, I, I guess I have a natural science background. And so uh, I think that, you know, as modern people, we have so much more, especially in this last century. There's been so much research and so much has gone uh, forward, you know, with technology and research and so forth. Uh, but I've always found that interesting that the Buddha said things that science has been, you know, now kind of proving. And I know the Dalai Lama has said that if science could prove that uh, reincarnation is not possible or it doesn't happen, he would accept that. And that's how we Buddhists are. We're not <laughs> stuck with that theory. <laughs> you know, uh, we say, oh, the, the sun is revolving around the earth. No, it's not. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Earth is uh, going around the sun. You know, we go with truth. It's not, we're not stuck with something. There's a song, uh, I guess it's uh, uh, Simon and Garfunkel, or anyway, uh, I'm not uh, stuck with what was true yesterday. Uh, I'll get the lyrics, but I use it in the retreats I do. But it's, it's true that we get stuck in what was true yesterday and we hang on to that. As I said, as you, well, if you taught teenagers, you know they hang on to something that they know is true at 17. And some of them hold on to it until they're 70. But I won't name it, mention names. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, no, yeah. Uh, as a teacher, <laughs> like, you know, there's different. Um, so that science pat, uh, analogy worked great for the STEM inclined. And, you know, like I to go into your question, you start off with how to, uh, you know, make Buddhism relevant for, for all it has to offer is that relevance. So that's, um, yeah. you know, so my second last question is, 
um, an observation of life. That's why I really appreciate what you're saying, not just because you said it, because I've experienced it to be true. You know, you said so much that just you put it into words. And it's something I've noticed through my life is um, uh, beloved people in my life who um, spontaneously um, may thank the universe or, or put it out to the universe. They use that word. And often they may have a more agnostic background, you know, a disillusion from organized religion, or they may have um, indigenous roots. So they, they come from a more animist, you know, kind of orientation. And um, would you say that when, you know, people do say that kind of generic, thank the universe, that it is, that is what you're talking about, the inconceivable truth and the universe not being what you said, but there's billions of universes, but yeah. the real true universe, you know, the oneness, yeah. the wholeness of it. And that's what is being expressed when people uh, say that. Um, when something is true, it's said in many different ways. And this is why a lot of different religions could say the same, uh, mean the same thing in different ways. Uh, I just like the way the Buddha said it. And um, often people, again, with this uh, coffee mug with, uh, you know, Christianity drinking uh, tea, we have this flavor in America that uh, religion should be a certain way. Uh, people are hesitant to give credit to Buddhism. Again, I just uh, noted a book by a woman who had uh, cancer, and she was a meditator and did mindful practice. And she wrote this book on how meditation and mindfulness really helped her through uh, her suffering in uh, cancer in relieving a lot of that. She doesn't, I didn't read the book, but this was kind of an ad for the book. She doesn't mention Buddhism at all. And then in uh, our Futaba talk, George uh, Tanabe was mentioning, um, uh, what's his name, um, uh, Eckhart Tolle and Marion uh, Williamson. And they talk about, Buddhist principles is that they came up with it, and so we're they call it they call it New Age. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and a lot of them, and this didn't come out until Buddhism came to America in the fifties, you know, fifties and sixties. But anyway, again, people are hesitant to put a religious label and say, uh, like this lady who wrote the book was doing Buddhist practices, but didn't acknowledge that. And I think, especially now, I'd like to use the, the fact that meditation and mindfulness are very common, uh, accepted American you know, practices or they're aware of it. And so um, I don't think we should shy away from that. Uh, and gratitude is, you know, being shown to be very effective, uh, changing brain chemistry and so forth. Uh, and this is a Shin way of life. You know, as uh, Dr. Bloom said, and on our BCA website, we have BCA, uh, uh, a life of gratitude. And th the thing is, in Shin Buddhism, we have a whole, little, you know, storehouse full of how to be grateful. <laughs> and again, I think uh, Buddhism influenced the culture of Japan, and that culture is about arigatai, or just this uh, attitude of being grateful. And so I think we need to claim that, and people will come to us not just for these little things, but uh, as I said, it will help at the spiritual level in life and death issues when we lose a loved one, to know that when someone goes, we are still connected spiritually. And that uh, it doesn't have to mean that they're little uh, uh, Gaspar, Gaspar the ghost floating around, but there's some energy around that's come down you know, from others that we pass on. And this is one reason why I think we have so many memorial services, to remember people, to thank them, Shotsky, Obon, you know, on and on, all the services we have to say, we're still connected. So that's, you know, where we uh, really uh, should not downplay that. And as you know, these things are not as popular anymore. We're too busy to have that service. <laughs> you know, we got to go to that ball game. And what I'm saying is, well, if we pay more attention to that spiritual side, it's going to help us. Especially when you get old like me, you know, <laughs> these concerns become much more real. We're all chapters in one much larger book, aren't we? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Arigatai. Reverend Nakahoshi, thank yes. you very much for yes. your time and sharing your wisdom. And um, I found it um, 
very enlightening. So thank you. Uh, um, I do want to everyone re remind everyone that we do have Sunday services at nine o'clock, either uh, Zoom by Zoom or in person, and you're all, you are all invited. Okay. Uh, I have one thing I want to share. Um, I met a, a young filmmaker in San Diego a few years ago. Uh, his name is uh, Yuji uh, Aseki. And um, he uh, is a young filmmaker, went to the Berkeley uh, UC uh, School of, uh, I guess, uh, Motion Pictures or whatever it is, was also in San Diego. But anyway, his father carves these statues and he made this documentary called Carving the Divine. And uh, he's shown it around to many of the film festivals and you can't show it publicly. Uh, once you show it publicly, you can't enter it into a film festival. Anyway, he won the Director and Movie Award at the Rain Festival in England, which is, I guess, a very prestigious one, and, and other awards as director and you know documentary. The reason I'm mentioning this is after he made this documentary, he found that that's not it. What you have to do is you have to have followers. So he started his channel on Buddhism. And so... Uh, he recorded and interviewed several, many uh, Buddhist scholars and ministers and so forth. Uh, and so anyone who wants to know anything about, well, it's actually Japanese religions. He goes into Shinto also. Uh, and I was one of the first, uh, I, I thought my interview was terrible. But also he has Reverend Harada, Bishop Harada, uh, and I think Jeff Wilson. But anyway, he's done a great service because people become interested in this carving the divine movie and they become interested in buddhism and and then also shin buddhism but i think uh he will be showing this movie uh publicly next year uh wow. so i said i'd help him you know uh, get to know other people so anyway look forward to that and if you go online just look at carving carving the divine you'll see a one minute or 30 second clip of it but uh, it's a very good uh, documentary, and uh, hopefully he'll be showing that next year sometime. So, okay. okay. Thank you. We'll, we'll uh, keep our eyes open because that's something that I think uh, we'd like to show in Temple for sure when it's out. So, thank you. So, um, Reverend Nishama, can I ask you to um, okay. close well, tonight? Thank you so much, Piper, for your coordinating tonight's um, session. And also, as a Jikoen uh, Hongkongji minister, thank you so much, Akao Sensei, for sharing the Dharma tonight. Um, we very enjoy the, you know, especially we enjoy your personality, of course. You're always smiling and then giving us a very wonderful, happy moment, like a Nembu's moment. <laughs> okay, so let's, let us uh, put that together in the show. And we decide the name of wisdom and compassion. Namo Amida Butsu. 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 Namo Amida Butsu.